welcome to this year's presentation with Dennis Gartman, Energy Presented Two Ways. We're going to start with the incumbent view from Dennis's 35 years of experience with all of the people that you've met along the years following this stuff, reading about it. You've missed only a couple days in 35 years? Yeah, one day. I'm going to let Dennis Gartman introduce himself. He doesn't need any more introduction. Dennis? I hope that applause was uh, for Johnny because I tell people before I do my speak, be careful about applauding for the speaker before you've heard it. You, you may regret it by the time it's finished. Uh, my name is Dennis Gardner, and as I tell everybody, I'm a trader. I made my money and in, in, in income over the years as a, a former floor trader on the Chicago Board of Trade. I got rich uh, three times down there, got broke two and a half times, loved it in both directions. Uh, a very strange place to have been at. Uh, the fellow who stood to the right of me uh, played uh, defensive tackle for my beloved North Carolina State University back in the 1960s and 70s. Brian O'Doherty, he was 275 pounds, six feet, six inches tall. He built basically black and blue the right side of my ribs in. The fellow who stood to the left of me in the pit was bigger than was Brian. He black and blue the right side of my ribs in. And the fellow who stood behind me in the pit, John Ott, was a spitter. A, a, a terrible place to, uh, to live and to work and to try to make a living. I have uh, been an economist uh, for the, since I got out of graduate school in the early 1970s from my beloved North Carolina State University. I have tried very hard in the last uh, 40 some years to overcome that fact. Everything they taught me in graduate work in economics has proven to be utterly and completely worthless. I wish I had spent more time studying philosophy. I wish I had spent more time studying literature. I wish I had spent a lot more time studying psychology because that's really what moves markets is the psychology of the moment, not the economics of the day. I was lucky enough before coming here, and if you haven't, this is a wonderful old building. And I walked down the hall back here and saw who had had parties in this wonderful room. We've had prime ministers, we've had premiers, we've had uh, uh, generals, we've had uh, the uh, governor general. And I broke the rule and, and had my cell phone with me and called my lovely bride of 26 years and said, you can't believe what this wonderful building is and who's been here. Would you in your wildest dreams have ever thought that your husband's going to be speaking in a place where prime ministers and premiers had spoken? And my wife said on the phone, hey, wait a minute. We've been married 26 years. It's been 28 since you've been in my wildest dreams. So, <laughs> so get, get things for, you know, smarten up. I tell everybody that my job from Southern Virginia is to be the the liberal arts major, the capital markets. I know a fair amount about what goes on in the grain market. I know a fair amount of what goes on in the foreign exchange market. I know a fair amount over the years of what happens in natural gas and crude oil. I know a fair amount about Federal Reserve policy. But I can't tell somebody who trades bonds more about the bond market than he or she knows, and if I can, he or she will not be trading bonds very long. I can't tell somebody in the grain business more about the grain industry than he or she knows, and if I can, he or she will not be trading grain for very long. And clearly, I cannot tell people who trade natural gas and crude oil more about the natural gas and crude oil market than, they, than he or she knows, and if I can, he or she will not be trading crude oil or natural gas very long. But my job is to be able to speak to the natural gas trader and say, look what's happening over here in the foreign exchange market. This may have some impact on what you do. My job is to explain to the grain trader, look what's going on over in the political circumstances in the Middle East. This may have some implication as to what you're doing in the grain industry. My job is to explain to somebody who trades bonds, look at what's going on in energy. This may have some implication as to what you're doing in the energy market. That's my job is to be, is to have an overview, a broad perspective, and it's a wonderful ability or position to be in in Southern Virginia, away from the matting crowd, away from the noise of, of the pit, away from the, the tumult of New York City, and to raise my hand every once in a while and say, this is interesting, you all should pay attention to what's happening here. So that's what I want to talk about today, is what's going on in the energy business around the world. And the title of the com uh, my comment is, God was not an energy market segregationist. It's a strange comment to be made. Why do I say that? When I was in undergraduate school in the 1960s, they absolutely told me, this was without equivocation, 
The same people now who are global warming us, who were then at that time global us, cooling us, were the same people who told us that we would be absolutely out of natural gas and out of crude oil by 1984. This was the accepted theory, the accepted thesis of the age, that there was a peak in energy production that by 1984, all would be gone. And everybody believed that. Everybody believed that. You had no choice. If you didn't accept that theology, you were anathema. I don't know about you, but since 1984, I've driven a car. Since 1984, I've flown in an airplane. Since 1984, I've cooled and heated my house with crude oil and natural gas that supposedly by 1984 would be gone. But what has happened is, and I now use the term manufacturing, we have turned, we have changed the finding of crude oil, the finding of natural gas. We have used new technologies that didn't exist in 1968, that didn't exist in 1972, that didn't exist until 1995 or so. Now with, with geology, with seismic technologies, that in the past, I always enjoyed the fact that people used to think that crude oil and natural gas deposits were rather finitely shaped. And you were lucky enough back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, when you sent the soda straw into the ground, and for lack of a better term, a drilling rig looks like a soda straw that you're driving into the ground in some manner. If you were lucky enough, your drill rate, your, your hit rates on that were probably at best 35 and 40 percent. <coughs> and we thought that that, 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 uh, that that energy deposit was rather well defined. Now we found out that those energy deposits look rather like your hand with fingers that extend for miles underground. <coughs> Until we had the ability, however, with seismic technology to really show what that, that formation looked like. And even when we could show what the formation looked like, we didn't have the technology to send down, and this has been the biggest change, the soda straw, instead of sending one soda straw down, and hope that you hit the top of that, that formation and maybe hit a gusher. <coughs> now we have the ability to take with horizontal drilling, which has changed the manner in which you go out and find energy all around the world. Now that hole, you can send it down and you bend it. Now you send another, another straw down and you bend it. Now you send another straw down and you bend it. And one straw can send 15, 16, 17 different straws out into the periphery, out into those fingertips, sucking crude oil, sucking natural gas from formations that in the past were simply not able to be attained. You could not go and get them. You couldn't find them, and even if you could find them, you couldn't get, couldn't get the energy out of them. We learned how to use <coughs> the technology called fracking. Fracking has changed the world. And yes, I understand that there are problems with fracking. Yes, I, I do not doubt for a moment that there are very small uh, earthquakes that occur on a daily basis across uh, uh, in, in Oklahoma, in Texas, in the Permian, in the Eagle Ford uh, formations. I don't doubt for a moment that those things occur. But when you frack, all you're simply doing is sending that a soda straw down. You're sending water with a propan. I love the term propan. It's something to prop open the fissures that you create with high pressure uh, li uh, li uh, liquids that you drive into the rock, fracture it, you send in sand behind it, open up, expand that, and out of there comes natural gas and crude oil in manners that we had never imagined before, from areas that we had never been able to explore before, getting some of the crude oil from areas that we never knew existed before. They told us in 1968 we would be out of crude oil by 1984. People actually believed, even after that, that there would be peak oil. That was the great philosophy 10 years ago, that we would have peak oil at some time in the future. I'm trying to remember the name of the fellow who was the proponent of the peak oil philosophy, King, King, King Higley. Totally, completely, utterly, fantastically wrong. There aren't many things in this world that I now count on. Your mom loves you. You're going to pay taxes. The University of North Carolina is going to cheat in sports in some manner. <laughs> it's just, that's, you can count on that. And there will be more proven reserves in the ground next year than there are this year. There will be more 10 years from now than there are than there will be next year. 10 years from now, there will be more than there will be five years from now. There will come a time. I have no idea when that time shall come. There shall come a time at some point in the next 100 years 
when indeed we probably do run out of natural gas and crude oil. Maybe. Before then, some new technology shall come along that will drive crude oil and natural gas to the sidelines. If there's somebody that we need to pay attention to in this world, we need to pay attention to the fellow who I think is going to become the most important fellow in the world in the next 50 years, the Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Prince Mohammed. He absolutely believes, he's made it abundantly clear, that he has every intention of producing as much crude oil as quickly as he can because he's convinced there will be some technology that completely obviates crude oil and drives crude oil prices to zero. Sometime along the line, whether it's nuclear fission, probably nuclear fusion, probably a combination of wind, probably a combination of algae, probably a combination of other technologies of which we are not even aware yet. Somewhere out there, there are two people working in a garage who are going to come up with some new technology that will, that will make crude oil absolutely worthless. And Prince Mohammed believes that. He intends, without equivocation, to continue to produce crude oil at 10 million, 11 million, 12 million. He can, if, he, if, he, if he really pushes the, the envelope as hard as I think he can, he'll probably try to get crude oil production at low rates in, in Saudi Arabia to 15 million barrels per day. Remember, in the United States, it was only five or six years ago, and don't hold me to the numbers because somebody will say, well, it, was, it should have been 8.5 instead of 8.7. But probably 15 years ago, the United States was barely, back in the 1970s, we were producing 10 million barrels of crude oil per day. We allowed that to fall down to about 6 million barrels of crude oil per day. But we're now back to over 10 million barrels of crude oil per day. And the trend, as I like to say, is from the lower left to the upper right. The United States very soon will be producing 11 million barrels of crude oil per day. And I don't pre preclude the fact that we can get to 12 million. Now, the, the, the topic of the, the, the title of my conversation this morning is that God was not a segregationist when it came to crude oil production. What do I mean by that? Do you realize that the Russians have only just fracked their very first well? The Russians have just fracked their very first well. They fracked one in Siberia about a month ago. They're going to learn how to use fracking technologies, how to use the proper propan, how to use the proper uh, drill rig, how to use the proper horizontal move, how to use the proper sand. All, of, all the things that we have learned through trial and error, the Russians are going to steal. It's not a question about that. They've only fracked one well. In a country that on balance is either the first or second largest producer of crude oil on a daily basis, if you don't think that Russia's going to have several thousand fracked wells in, in, in operation in another two years, you're naive. There have been no fracked wells anywhere in Africa. If you don't think the Nigerians, the Angolans, the Libyans, if you don't believe that they're going to find the same methodologies of producing crude that we have done in another several years, you are naive. The Chinese have never fracked a well yet. If you don't think that the Chinese are going to have hundreds of fracked wells in operation in several years, you are naive. The Saudis have never fracked a well, to the best of my knowledge. If you don't think the Saudis are going to frack wells in the next several years, you are naive. Think about the amount of crude oil that's going to be found I think almost guaranteed over the course of the next 10 years that exists that nobody even expects to come right now. I think the amount of crude oil that we're going to see coming to the world is astonishing. But it's not even crude oil that's important. What's really important to me is the amount of natural gas that's coming to the market. Think about this. In the Marcellus Shale, which is a shale formation <coughs> that exists from the western part of, uh, of Virginia goes up through West Virginia, up through Maryland, up through Pennsylvania, up through New York, goes all the way up to the St. Lawrence Seaway. Huge shale formation. There's even, because of some extensions of, of the Marcellus Shale and its, and, and its correspondence, there's even large production of natural gas and crude oil in, in my home state where I grew up, Ohio. Who ever thought of Ohio as being a producer of natural gas and crude oil? But we are. They are. What's fascinating to me, is that there are so many wells having been drilled in Marcellus that are so productive that at times Marcellus shale natural gas sells at negative numbers. Negative numbers. They can't shut the well off. They don't want to because if you shut the well off, it costs too much money to reopen it again. So they have to produce, even if the sum of, uh, the sum of money that they're getting from that natural gas production is negative. I think that's amazing. 
Is that going to go away anytime soon? No, because it's close to the New York demand. It's close to the Connecticut demand. It's close to the Boston demand. It's close to the Baltimore demand. And that's going to continue to grow. We haven't even begun. We've been, we, we've been flaring off natural gas for the course of the last 40 years. We have to learn how to use that natural gas, and we shall. Why? Because it is the cleanest of all possible fuels. It is absolutely sparkling clean. You get no contaminants in the atmosphere from natural gas. We've now learned how to freeze it, put it on a ship, and send it. The problem with natural gas in the past is that it was only transportable on land via pipeline. So you could get ridiculously large R differences between natural gas in one country and natural gas in another until we had the ability to freeze it, ship it, transport it, and we're now beginning to do that. So now, what used to be natural gas in the United States at like three cents per, per million British thermal units and gas in, in Japan at $12 per million British thermal units, that arbitrage has narrowed down to where there's only three cents difference now, and that's going to narrow completely over the course of the next 50 years. People need to pay attention to what's going on in the natural gas market for the simple reason that it's such a clean and, and useful fuel to be used. We now are going to be, we have cars now that burn natural gas, of course. I watch the trucks in, in my neighborhood, the, the, the trash trucks. They're all now powered not by gasoline, not by diesel, but by natural gas. We have buses that are powered by natural gas. Soon you're going to have your own car that's powered consistently by natural gas. Gas and crude oil are becoming abundant. Pay attention to what's going on in what I call the term structure. Watch what's happening. In storable commodities, every, a storable commodity should have a price of this level. The next future back should be higher. The next future back should be higher. The next future back should be higher than that. The next future back should be higher than that. When you see that, that's what's known as a contango. That tells you more about the term, the term structure tells you more about where prices are going than any other instrument that I know of and that, that, that I've seen in the course of the past 35 years. In a bull market, you ought to have the market go to backwardation, which is where the front month is above the back month. The next month is, behind, is lower, the next month is lower, the next month is lower. That's what bull markets look like because bull markets are markets demand where demand has outstretched supply. And you get what's known as an inversion, a backwardation. But natural gas right now is contango, crude oil is contango, Brent is contango, WTI is contango, Dubai futures are contango, and even on rallies, the back months rally less, the front months rally, or the back months rally more, the front months rally less, and the contango widens. That tells me all I need to know about how much crude and how much natural gas there exists in the world. Until you can move the market to a backwardation, and the Saudis have said that there was, that's their intention. They hope they can get a backwardation. It's not going to happen. Even after they made the announcement two weeks ago, the contango, the term structure, continued to widen and to widen and to widen and to widen some more. Technology has changed the absolute demeanor of the energy market around the world. What will we replace it? I have no idea. I have no idea what will replace it. And I use that term, I, I, I say that. Because I grew up, if you can look on this map, show more Akron is. That's, that's Akron and Canton. The other bright spot is Cleveland. I grew up between Akron and Cleveland. Akron, Ohio, where I grew up and spent my formative years, was where the world's tires were all manufactured. BF Goodrich, Goodyear, Firestone, all were there. Every one of them. Why Akron is still a question beyond that I'm not capable of answering. But since 1974, not a single tire, not one, has been manufactured in Akron, Ohio. Not one. The entire industry left. It moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina. It moved to Fayetteville, North Carolina. It moved to uh, Alabama. Then it moved to Malaysia. Then it moved to Africa. Then it moved to other places around the world. But not one single tire has been manufactured in Akron, Ohio since 1974. And yet the unemployment rate in Akron, Ohio is exactly the same as the rest of the United States, about 4.5%. What has happened? Why am I bringing this topic up? Because it shows you how good North America is when it comes to changing, when it comes to dealing with the uncertainties of the future. If you ask the people of Akron, Ohio, 
Would they like the rubber companies to come back? Would you like six of these rubber companies that were massive in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even into the 1970s, would you like them to come back? And you'll get an overwhelming response, not really. We don't need them back. We've gone on to something else. If you ask the people of Akron, Ohio, what, would, what has replaced it, they will then look at you quizzically and say, I'm not really sure. But instead of having six companies that employ 20,000 people each and the ancillary responsible uh, businesses that went along with them, the restaurants, the dry cleaners, the, 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 the suppliers of goods and services, those are all gone, have been utterly and completely replaced by instead of six companies with 20,000 people, 6,000 companies with 200 people. It's the beauty of capitalism. It's the beauty of what goes on when you can disrupt a, 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 an industry and we replace it. That's, to me, the most important thing to remember. Nobody would have understood. No government could have ever said, we know that the rubber companies are going out of work, and here's what we think should replace them. Because government can't do that. Government hasn't the intellect. Government hasn't the ability to, to analyze where the future is going to be. Nor do you. Nor do I. Nor did anybody think there would ever be such a thing as an iPhone. Nobody thought that the computers would be as ubiquitous as they are, that we all carry one in our pocket, capable of launching missiles out of the, your iPhone. Nobody thought of those things 15 years ago. There'll be something else to replace them in another five or 10 years. The important point being, optimistically, there will be something to replace it. And so I tell you that the most important person of the next 50 years is, is uh, Deputy uh, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed, who said to the world, I know that what I'm producing in the ground right now, my one asset that I have, that nobody else has as abundantly as I do, is going to be worth zero, probably in the next generation, or at most two generations from now. So what must I do? I have no choice but to sell it as fast and as aggressively as I possibly can and replace it with something else, invest that capital in, in new industries, he's probably going to have the largest hedge fund, for lack of a better term, bigger than Norway's uh, fund that it has for the succeeding generations. His will be the largest in the world, billions upon billions of dollars invested broadly around the world. Let me talk more about technology and how things have changed in other arenas, and then we'll open it back up for discussion. People don't realize, for example, nobody understood GPS. Nobody knew the myriad numbers of businesses that GPS was going to create on the ground in the world. But it's fascinating to me. If you go, everybody talks now about having autonomous automobiles, non-driving non automobiles. In farming, they've had non-driving tractors for years. In farming, they've had non-driving planters for years. In, in farming, they've had non-occupied non fertilizing equipment for years. Think about farming and how it has changed by technology. <clears throat> GPS <clears throat> sends a signal down to your tractor. In the old days, if you were growing 5,000 acres of corn in Iowa, which is a nice sized farm, it's not a big farm, but it's a decent sized farm in Iowa, you had no idea other than walking through your field after the corn had gotten to this tall, how you would fertilize. You fertilized to the lowest common denominator. You fertilized to what you thought you saw, and you applied fertilizer across all 5,000 acres in that manner. Now instead, you're driving a fertilizing machine through the field, sending a signal down to, to, the, to the driverless computer moving that fertilizer machine through the field, telling it to, to, to increase the, the phosphate for the next 30 feet, decrease the phosphate for the next 50 feet, increase the phosphate, increase whatever fertilizer you're doing for the next 200 feet. It's telling you to change and you fertilize to perfection. We no longer have a runoff. It doesn't happen anymore. When you used to fertilize to lowest common denominator, you had fertilizer flowing out of your, out of your farm into the streams, into the rivers, and creating down the Mississippi a huge algae bloom. Those are disappearing. It's more efficient. It's better. It produces a better crop, much larger crop. There aren't many things, again, in this world that you can absolutely count on. But the one thing that you, one of those things that you can count on is next year, 
drought in or drought out, every wheat farmer in North America is going to grow more wheat than he grew last year per acre. Absolutely. Every farmer is going to grow more corn drought in or drought out next year than he grew this year. Every farmer is going to grow more soybeans next year than he grew this year. And in 10 years, they'll grow even more. And in 20 years, they'll grow even more, and they'll do it more efficiently. It's phenomenal what's happening. I grew up in the cotton business. That was my first job out of graduate school. I was the, the, the economist for Cotton Incorporated. Cotton keeps America feeling comfortable. It used to be when you went off to college, all of us did this. You went off to college, you, put your, you did your laundry for the first time. You threw a red shirt in with your underwear, and all your underwear came back pink. Everybody did it. Nobody's escaped that fact. You know what? It's not going to happen to the next generation. Why? Because we now grow cotton with color. We genetically engineered the cotton plant to grow color. It's a funny looking cotton. It isn't as beautiful and white as the old cotton, but it holds dye absolutely perfectly. We genetically engineered the cotton crop to be different. We have to change in the United States. We're going to have to change the language of that great song, America the Beautiful, because we're not going to have, or we don't even have, amber waves of grain anymore. It used to be the wheat crop was grown this tall. Why did you grow a wheat crop that tall when what you were after was the kernel of wheat? Why didn't you genetically modify or change the plant so that the wheat crop only grows this tall? Instead of using fertilizer to grow straw, grow straw that's that small grow wheat that has more kernel to it. We, we, the, the amount of wheat that you get, the amount of production per bushel per acre has gone from the lower left to the upper right. You, lose, you use less fertilizer. And because you have a smaller plant, when the wind blows, it doesn't blow down. When the rain comes, it doesn't get rained down. If it does, it can spring back up. If there's a great change going on, it's technology and agriculture, not just in energy, but in areas that we really don't those of us who are in the trading business, those of us in the investment business, don't hear about these amazing changes where we take prosaic things like growing grains. Instead of high tech, we've, used, we've taken the high tech nature of things and changed the prosaic nature of farming into something far more technologically abundant. One of my favorite things, however, as I love this, is how government can screw things up. Always and everywhere, government screws things up. In New York, where the Marcellus Shale extends at its most vital through the state of New York, New York has outlawed fracking. New York, which has the greatest demand for natural gas and crude oil because of its population, in the summertime, you need natural gas in the summer to, to fire electricity units to give you the air conditioning. It's the only way you can survive in New York City during the summer because it smells bad when the heat goes, when it gets to 95 degrees, and you need to have air conditioning going. New York banned fracking. Get a map. Go and Google the number of frack dwells on the Pennsylvania-New York border. It is hysterical. There are hundreds of wells on the Pennsylvania side. There are no wells, obviously, on the New York side. And yet every one of the people who've drilled a well, and remember, now we don't drill straight down. Now we drill and we go horizontal. Now we drill and we go horizontal. Now we drill at a different level. We go horizontal. Now we drill, we go horizontal. Every one of those wells on the Pennsylvania side will tell you that their horizontal drills are not going into New York. Oh, bull. Of course they are. And every year you, you learn how to go instead of 200 yards, 500 yards, and we're now drilling horizontally two and three miles. I guarantee you every one of those wells on the New York-Pennsylvania border are drilling into New York. It's an amazing time in which we live. We have to remember, as I started the conversation, God was not a segregationist when it came to the, to the adoption of and the, and the formation of frackable land. Russia's only started one. China hasn't done any. None have been done in Africa. None have been done in Saudi Arabia. But in the United States, we have thousands. And we've taken production of crude oil from 5 million barrels of crude a mere 10 years ago back to 10 million barrels of crude. And we'll be at 11 and 12 in the next two years. Remember, 
In the old days, one well went down, your hit rate was probably 40 or 50 percent. Now our hit rates are 70 or 80 or 90 percent because of GL, because of seismic technologies, which lets us see into the ground better than we ever did before. And now when we send that down, everybody gets excited on Fridays when the rig count comes in and can't figure out why the rig count. We, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, we had 1,600 rigs working in the United States. We now only have about 450. And yet production keeps going up every week. Why? Because out of that one well, we send 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 bent soda straws, sucking crude oil and natural gas from the fingers that in the past we couldn't even touch. It is an amazing world in which we live. And technology has driven a prosaic industry such as drilling. And what's more prosaic than drilling? It has taken drilling and made it high tech. So I use the term manufacturing. We have learned how to manufacture, how to manufacture energy in places that we used to couldn't find, even didn't know it existed. Now that we know it exists, we're able to find more and more and ever more. So that's my story. I think that the probabilities of crude oil rallying much beyond $50 per barrel, WTI or Brent, is, is almost non-existent. I think the problem shall be that we can find natural gas at $3.50 per million British thermal unit. The ability to, the, unless there is some really untoward, unacceptable, and inexplicable political development that exists, or that, that suddenly comes to the surface, probabilities of seeing natural gas getting much above five, I think, are almost impossible. And remember, in the Marcellus Shale, they are selling natural gas at zero or less because they don't want to close the wells that they have there now, just in case. And finally, remember, Russia only fracked its first well. There will be hundreds, if not thousands, in the next several years. And the problems that the Russians have we can shut off a well relatively quickly. We can cap a well relatively quickly. The Saudis can shut off a well or cap a well relatively quickly. In, so in, in Siberia, you cannot shut a well off. Because if you do, it freezes over and you have to re-drill it. And they won't do that. So the problem for the Russians in the next 50 years is the fact that they're going to have to continue to produce once they frack a well, once they drill a well, they have to keep that well open, and they will always be the, the marginal supplier of crude oil. So that's my story. Understand how important technology has been. It's changing agriculture. It's changing your life. It's changing how we find and use crude oil. And it's going to be, I think, the, the enemy of prices for crude oil and natural gas for the next 50 years until something else replaces it. And remember, when crude oil was first found in Titusville in, what, 1859, whatever that year was, we used it for lighting purposes. They didn't even know about automobiles yet. Nobody had any idea there was going to be this thing called the internal combustion engine. They used it for lighting. It replaced whale oil. That's what you have to remember. There will be something new that comes along. I guarantee it. So that's my story. I'm sticking with it. As my old friend Paul Tudor Jones always used to say, Trade and investments like falling in love. Put your arms around that idea and you hold her tight until she shows you the first sign of disrespect and you throw her overboard and disavow any association whatsoever. <laughs> so that's my story. I'd like to turn back over to you. stories. I'm going to go through my version of energy and how I see it. I followed it now for well, about 15 years, 20 but 15 more acutely, and I love history, economic history. Now Ferguson, Fried Zakaria, and our friend Don Pass. And if I look back historically speaking, I can tell you that in my opinion the world changed on January 10th of 1901. That was the day they discovered spindle top. This was the first true oil gusher. It was drilled by a, a Croatian fellow, his name was Anthony Lucic, he changed his name to Anthony Lucas, and when they capped that, that was at the same time so many things happened, and it's true. 
Whaling was definitely the lubricant of the American economy. And it was really illumination. But at this time, as all these inventions started to occur, the airplane, they started converting ships from coal to, to fuel oil, the automobile. There's a picture of Spindletop. When I drove my car across America, I drove an electric car, Tesla, everyone knows that. I stopped there and I, I started to explain to people where the difference between Nikola Tesla and Anthony Lucas. They invited me to come into the museum and people were taking pictures of my electric car in the famous Spindletop. This was truly the greatest you know, convergence in, in, in history of, of uh, American enterprise. All that would occur until 1938. This was the first year that they discovered oil in Saudi Arabia. 1908 was the first time they discovered oil in the Middle East. But they didn't think there was oil in Saudi Arabia. 1937, the Standard Oil of California, they would have the concession. They would pay Ivan Saud $275,000. The British said, you can have it. There's no oil there. Well, they discovered it. And then the next year, Harold Likas, the Secretary of the Interior, he would send America's foremost geologist, go to Saudi Arabia, please tell us, what does this mean? And they reported back, this is the greatest prize in all history. And the, the famous title for Dan, Daniel Gergen's book of 2011. I asked you then, what could then make that redundant? Is that not the new greatest prize in all history? So if we look back, and all these things are converging now, we have to ask ourselves the question, have we entered the end, or the beginning of the end, of the oil age. So the presentation I'm going to give you is a colorful depiction on this pivot, looking at it as a consumer, as an investor, and you have to really dig down into the, into the nuts and bolts. If you look at these things that are converging, of course, climate change is topical, and governments are you know, making adjustments. Uh, Donald Trump famously pulled America out of the Paris Accord. I don't look at it that way, though. I look at it more of the technology, is it possible, and particulate pollution. Look at this picture of London. The city's all over the world. It's not just climate change. You have to address particulate pollution. I remember Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld's show, and the one time a Jewish guy was telling really bad Jewish jokes, and he said, it doesn't insult me as a Jewish person, it insults me as a comedian that this guy's telling bad jokes. I look at this stuff, it doesn't insult me as a self-proclaimed realistic environmentalist, it insults me as a capitalist. This is a tremendous business opportunity. The Chinese are not looking at it this way. What you see here, they don't want this moniker of made in China anymore, innovated in China. Who are the leaders? Electric cars, electric buses, charging for these vehicles, wind power, solar power, solar voltaic, solar thermal power. The Chinese. You need to embrace this. If you're, if you're an investor, and this is algebra, I want to invest in the things that are in the future, not in the past, and that's the way we have to look at it. And so if you look at this algebra, we call him the fat man of fossil fuels, and that's really what's happening, be it fast or be it slow. We want to live in the green box. That's where we live. This is what Don Cox says. Never invest in the story on page one. That's the efficient market. What you want to do is invest in the story on page 16 that will one day be on page one. And Don Cox says he made a career out of doing this. I have studied energy for over 20 years. I have a unique life experience. I spent my first 10,000 hours doing electricity, power systems, energy savings. And then living in Vancouver, I got into investing in oil and copper and natural resources. Energy, my friends, is three individual buckets. How do we make energy, the generation of it? The transfer of energy from point A to point B. There's only three ways to do that. You can do it with a pipeline, gas and oil. You can move it with a ship or railroad or you can make it electricity and move it with a cable from point A to point B. But the overarching reason is utility. If you and I as consumers are not consuming more energy, there is no requirement for the other two. And we are, as a society, with more people consuming more things, we do need more energy. I look at this word, motorization. When we went from the age of illumination, we went into the age of motorization. And this is extremely important to follow. And we're gonna get back to this later on. But right now, rule of thumb, of all the oil that's consumed every single day, about 55% of that is consumed in transportation fuels, an engine of some sorts. Pretty simple. If you make an internal combustion engine more efficient, you will use less petroleum products. This is my unscientific graph. The other 45% is typically used for enhanced products. The chair you're sitting in, the shoes you're wearing, rubber, plaster, polyester, everything. The future of oil will not be in the creation of transportation fuels. 
It's going to be, you're going to share the profit of that intense product. This is my unscientific graph, and as you can see here, we consume 96 million barrels of oil every single day. This is what the experts believe is going to happen. Big oil and the IEA, the International Energy Agency. They believe that the demand for oil will continue. A little bit of a different trajectory. I will give you one piece of anecdotal information. The IEA in the year 2010, they, said they thought that it would take 15 or 16 years for the world to produce 150 gigawatts of solar power. That was their prognostication. They were wrong. The world produced 290 gigawatts of solar power in five years. They were wrong. They were completely, totally wrong. They forgot about these things. Efficiency, adoption, innovation, technology. You're a consumer. You've got a, you've got a say in this too. What if, you're, what if your behavior changes? What if your spending patterns? What if all these people, these armies of people working on things as capitalists, that you buy them? What about them? We need to put this into consideration. So I've been saying, I was on CNBC in San Francisco, and I said, and I do believe this, they all work collectively. There's no collusion, but it's all coming on all sides. Innovation, adoption, technology. And so we can look back now, the day that they capitulated, this is the day it happened. Now, we'll have to look in the, in the future. Why do I say this? Remember I mentioned the date of January 10th, 1901? I believe this is the day that they capitulated because that's the day the Saudi Arabians said, we are no longer the swing producer in oil. We are no longer this person. And as, as Dennis Gartman said, they have 100 years of reserves. What would you do if you had 100 years of reserves? The game has changed. We have to look at supply and demand. So Dennis has a picture of the way we used to drill for oil. Now I knew you were going to talk about this. That's why I put these pictures here. I'm not going to harp on this. This is the way we do it now. One little platform, and they go two miles in each direction, 20, 30 horizons. This is a picture of the Permian. This is on the west part of Texas, Midland. They just found another 25 billion barrels. Wolf can't play. I'm going to give you the numbers here. What this really was was the merger of two gentlemen's companies. George Mitchell, who lived north of Dallas, he lived in the Dallas area, and he owned 60% of Mitchell Energy. He kept financing his guys, crack the fracking code, crack the fracking code, and they did. And in 2001, 2002, they realized that gas production rates in Dallas were skyrocketing. So the guys up in Oklahoma, Devon Energy, Mr. Nichols and his boys, they were the ones doing the horizontal stuff. You know this, Dennis. And what they did is they married those two technologies in 2002. It was the two companies marrying the fracking and the horizontal drilling. Look at this. They drilled seven wells in the year 20, 2002. 2003, 55 horizontal frack wells. Now everyone caught on to this. It was working. They were doing natural gas mining. It was not until like 07, 08, 09 they converted to drill for oil. Do you know how many horizontal frack wells the American oil and gas industry completed up until 2015? 150,000. This is a game changer. What Dennis is telling you about Russia, about Saudi Arabia, and other places in the world, they have not started this yet. Why? Because the oil price collapsed. They did this because in the United States, you needed 70, 80, 90 dollars to make a profit. Not anymore. Look at the numbers. Staggering efficiencies. They can make money at $20, $30 oil. The game has changed. And it's so true. What will happen to the oil price? I do not have a crystal ball, and I don't know what's going to happen. But I can look at clues. Because I read three or four hours every day. And I read from different publications. And if I look at my, once again, unscientific graph, it's basic economics 101. Supply. Demand. Now, I feel that demand for oil is not going to be what big oil and what the IEA say. I think a portion of all of the efficiency adoption technology is going to eventually impact demand. But can all these people, they all have plus or minus 100 years of reserves, plus or minus. What are they going to do? It's musical chairs. If there's 98 people trying to sit in 99 chairs, you will never have a premium, not product. I don't care if it's hogs or it's lawns. In this case, it's oil. 
So the, there are the three most important letters in the oil business. Please remember them. I've put a picture here of this gentleman, which is the most important person in the world of oil. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%, Dennis. And he had a choice. Does he pivot his economy? We don't live in static times. We live in progressive times. He chose, and he's chosen the way of the future. Here's another way to look at it. Shall he be a victim, or shall he be a contrarian? So that is what he's done. They're floating 5% of Saudi Aramco. They're going to pivot the economy. They're going to invest hundreds of billions of dollars into what? Technology and electrification. <laughs> this movement, which is now $4.6 trillion of money under management, you cannot make this stuff up. Who are the biggest supporters of the investment movement? The Norwegian Oil Endowment. And now the biggest participant is going to be the Saudi Arabian economy. In divestment. Hello, this is a ring the bell for everyone. Every investor, every consumer. You need to recognize this. We look at big oil. And I understand big oil. My, my friends produce oil. It has given us tremendous convenience and the lifestyle we have is because we had abundance of oil for the past 120, 130 years. We shall not poke sticks at big oil. We shall appreciate it. But what I will make clear, there's been never a collusion between big auto and big oil. I don't believe that. Many people will look at this picture here and they'll say, oh, they've always gotten together and they've hampered us from having products that don't use petroleum products. You have to understand the car business. And if you understand the car business, you need to look at Japan, and Germany, neither of which have any kind of a petroleum endowment. This beautiful Maserati from the 1930s, you can see, hasn't changed in 100 years. Six to 7,000 total parts in that car. These are companies from Germany. I'll wave my little German flag. I speak German, I go there all the time, and I have friends that invest in German car companies. What is the biggest employer in the 82 million people live in Germany? What's the biggest employer in the country of Germany? The automotive industry. Recognize these guys. They make things like cranks, pistons, radiators, valves, chains, belts, mufflers. You're not an automotive engineer, are you guys? How many mufflers in an electric car? No, zero. That's zero, exactly. So if you're a company that makes 800,000 mufflers per year, when you make the electric car, you go to zero. This is the way we make a car now. Now, the, uh, the automotive industry is interesting because you don't make money selling cars. The money is made in servicing the car. There are only 25 major components, 100 real ones if you want to really count it down in an electric car. There are so fewer things to fail, it changes that industry forever. But they've got bigger concerns on their tails. <coughs> Big tech. Big tech's arrived. Let this baby represent the technology that you, the incumbent, must invest in. They do not want to become Kodak Film Company or Blockbuster Video or Blackberry for that matter. What keeps them up at night now is big tech. Big tech is far, far bigger than big auto or big oil. You look at the biggest companies in 2006, in fact, you go back 100 years, not anymore. By a power of magnitude, these companies, they have more cash than the market cap combined of these companies. They must pivot their business model, and I can assure you they surely are. Every 12, 13, and 14 year old has a personal chauffeur. If you have a cellular phone or an iPod for five or ten dollars, you can navigate across Raleigh, North Carolina, and you can be 14 years old. They have a bigger threat. People that have grown up, they're 23, 24 years old, they're not getting their license. They are never going to be the customer of Big Auto ever. This is their problem. Because if you look at these brands, these 14 companies, they control the automotive industry. They are now pivoting so they can embrace these younger people who eventually become their customer. They control all 54 brands. And because of technology, and because of ride sharing, and so many other things, this industry has officially changed. You will not recognize the product offering in the coming years. What you're looking at here is the automotive sales of 2016. Now follow the blue arrow. The blue arrow is the important part here. This is the 1% of car sales last year that were electric vehicle. And people say, oh, it's going to take forever. No. When you have price parity, you will have adoption within five or six years of 30, 40%.
I drove across America in his Tesla and I stopped. And Dennis and I had a fantastic lunch in your country club in Norfolk, Norfolk, Suffolk, Suffolk. Yes, <laughs> the way they say it there. I drove across America. I drove 13,000 kilometers because I needed to, I knew it worked, but I needed to tax the system. And in the beginning, I would meet with Tesla owners and it would be a big love in and everyone would say, oh, it's amazing and it's great. That was boring. No, no, I want to meet skeptics. I want to meet the people that say it doesn't work, it no charging, range anxiety, all these other things, because they solved the puzzle. It, it completely works. I never had an issue. I drove across America. I didn't pay one dollar for fuel. I didn't pay for parking. That's not matter. This is going to change very quickly. And this is the route I took. You drive a car across America every three hours. It takes 20 minutes to top it up and go. This little company was achieved all this infrastructure in three years. This is not required. This is the old way. Look for oil, you move it, you refine it. You move it and people buy the product. I believe the future of the oil business is increasingly going to be in the way you calibrate your refining capacity. <coughs> you make 40 or 50 products when you refine a barrel of oil. Three or four of them are transportation fuels. So I think that that portion is going to be more important because the future will come like this. This is the way you charge a Tesla and any electric car on the freeway, very quickly. But in your home, in your garage, at your country club, these things are installed in a matter of hours. And they will be installed, these things here, in the tens of millions, in the tens of millions in the coming. It will not matter where you park a car, you will see this. You won't even, be, you won't even top up your car, it'll just be so ubiquitous. People always tell me that if you're charging your car, you're doing it with coal, this fantastic cartoon is a really good way to signify that. That's not true. The future of how they're going to do this is increasingly going to be this way. But for now, there's going to be transition. This is America's fuel supply. The black represents coal. It used to be 50, 60% of America's electricity came from coal. Today, it's natural gas and climbing. And you're also going to see these other bars. They're going to climb. It's going to be a, a, a mixture of renewables and natural gas. You understand the difference between a gigawatt, a megawatt, and a kilowatt. Very important. Your typical large power plant is one gigawatt, which is 1,000 megawatts. OK, so that's all you need to know. One. The number one is pretty easy to remember, right? Anytime you drive by a large power plant, it's a gigawatt, roughly. Hydro-Quebec, which was the largest electrical exercise of its time, took up 25 years. 61 generators, and has a capacity of 36 gigawatts. RBC Hydro, 11 gigawatts. The whole province, if you put all the hydro together. So this is a picture of the United States of America. America's capacity is 1,100 gigawatts. They've converted 200 gigawatts of coal into natural gas. China, which is probably the same size as the United States, has a capacity of 1,000. 500 gigawatts. The growth in China, they've built in the past seven or eight years 150 gigawatts of wind power. Five Quebec hydros. 100 gigawatts of solar. Why do they like natural gas? Natural gas is, augments your renewable energy. If you have a nuclear power plant, it takes a month to turn it up and down. If you have a coal-fired power plant over and above having a stoke with coal, it takes a week. If you have natural gas, it's a light switch. It just makes business sense. There is a tremendous future for natural gas. And because of LNG, this is how Japan, China, and many countries around the world, it'll increasingly, and natural gas has a tremendous role to play in the future of energy. This is a picture of Africa, and you see 900 million people live in that square. The electrical capacity of sub-Saharan Africa, if you take away South Africa, is 28 gigawatts. About the same as Arizona. Is this going to change? I think so. And this is how it works. That works today. This is how they do it. It works. They should be providing all this technology. Why should the Chinese do it? If I could take the Donald, if I could take him by the hand, and I'm sure he's got a lot of advisors, pulling out of Paris is one thing. But why invest in the old technology? If I could take them by the hand and show them how this stuff works, if we could go and look at batteries, if we could look at this solar roof.
people laugh when Elon Musk bought solar in the city. This is, it's a trifecta, you have to have all three. This roof costs about the same, it's very robust. Now I say it's the same of a really high quality roof. And so if you look at this, this house, do these three components change the energy mix forever? Yes, yes they do. This house can be self-efficient. Whether it's that little guy in Africa or whether it's a house in suburban Kansas City or Phoenix, Arizona, it turns everything on its head. I get back to motorization now. 40, the natural number is 46%, but I have 45 here. 46% of America's electricity is consumed by a motor, electrical motor. And when you make an electrical motor more efficient, you use more copper. Internal combustion engine, less oil, electric motor, more copper, or if you're adopting to it. Number two, it doesn't matter how you create energy, if it's going to be greener and cleaner, it takes 400, 500, 600 percent more copper. I'm talking about wind and solar, all these different applications. The holy grail is efficiency. If you make anything electrical more efficient, it means you're using more copper. Never mind the formula. And this is the number four. This is important. This is what you call the PhD in the economy, guys. As you get, as you become an advanced economy, the installed copper in America is 650 pounds. In Japan and Korea, it's about 550, 600 pounds. In China right now, it's 160. So if the Chinese economy slows down, in theory, copper should be less interesting. But there's a new invisible hand in copper markets, and it's pervasive from the smallest village to the biggest city. Before, it was this Chinese economy that grew from 2 trillion of output to 12. Now, it's modern energy. You cannot tabulate. I've told this to the analysts at CRU, you cannot model this. It's so pervasive through the economy, there's no way to tell. But McKinsey and company has done it. They've tried. And if you look at the five major commodities, the only one with customer growth is copper. Because all the other ones start weighing over. Think about it. Does not matter how you pivot this energy mix, it's electrification and typically more deluxe that requires more copper. So then you have to ask yourself, where does all this copper come from? It comes from very few mines. It's not like the oil business. If you discover copper, it takes 15 years to have copper production. These 20 mines give us 45% of primary production. And there's been no fracking moment. There's been no new technological advancement. This is what happens to the copper industry if there's no reinvestment. It falls off a cliff. And it's not the will. There's lots of that in Vancouver, lots of that in Santiago, lots of that in Phoenix, Arizona with my friends at Freeport. It's the money. It's not a business. It's not a business. No one can finance a copper mine. No one's building a copper mine. Isn't this interesting? This is why I say it has to be copper. It has to. It has to. It's basic economics. So we follow the oil to gold ratio. We can also follow the copper to gold ratio. What I'm asking you, Dennis, maybe we should start looking at the copper to oil ratio. Maybe we should start looking at the copper to gold to oil ratio. I believe we've already entered this. If you go back 40 years on this chart, they are like a monolithic group because oil is just so big. And the rule book tells you if oil collapses, all these big commodity indexes, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. Or as you say, and I've read in your letter, when they raid the house of ill repute, they arrest everyone, including the piano player. It doesn't matter. It's a panic. Let's look at the one here. See, it happened here. It happened here. Look at this, in one year. Down 10%. That's a 40% difference, my friends. If you were in short oil and long copper, you made a fortune last year. That's an interesting trade. What do you think? Let's open it up to Q&A. Yeah.